were to take a bacterium and look at its cytochrome C and compare how different it is with these creatures cytochrome C, I would expect a line that looks like this. I would expect for, since the bacterium is the simplest life form, I would expect the yeast to be the least different from it, the most similar. I would expect the wheat to be a little more different, the moth to be a little more different, all the way up until the horse is the most different. That's what I would expect, wouldn't I? What do the data say? This is what the data say. <laughs> that in fact, if you believe the statistics at all, the yeast is actually a little, more, a little less similar to the bacterium than the horse is to the bacterium. But basically, that pink line shows very little trend. Basically, yeast, sweets, moths, tunas, pigeons, horses are about the same difference from, that of a, from the cytochrome C of a bacterium. That's awfully hard to understand from an evolutionary point of view. Awfully hard to understand. Because after all, you would expect the yeast to come first, so it should be most similar or least different from uh, bacterium. That's not what we say. So that's pretty bad, pretty bad evidence. So what's an evolutionist to do? Well, the best thing to do is simply lie. And that's what, you know, all you have to do is put uh, amino acid and cytochrome C in a search engine. And you'll find all sorts of professors' websites that give this particular sequence where they're taking a human cytochrome C and comparing it to that of a monkey, a rabbit, a horse, a tuna, a screwworm, a yeast, a wheat, and a bacterium. And what's percentages means percent difference. In this particular sequence, we do see exactly what evolutionists predict, right? Uh, percent difference is between the human and the rhesus monkey is the lowest. The percent difference between the human and the bacterium is the greatest. So in the end, this is the one sequence that always is, is shown when, when uh, people talk about amino acid sequences and uh, uh, evolution. The problem is, this represents less than 1% of the data. In order to get this sequence, you have to actually cherry pick. You have to take this particular species over here, then you have to look around and take this particular species over here. That's the only way you can get this trend. The vast majority, more than 99% of the data in this regard, look like this. But you'll never see that uh, discussed in evolutionary sources. You'll see this one discussed. And that's truly unfortunate. This is an incredibly highly selective view of the data. It represents less than 1%. The vast majority of data from amino acid sequencing shows the other trend. So of course the thing you do is simply lie about it. Because that's what you need to do if you want to convince them of your theory. Now there's another thing you can do with data when it doesn't agree with you. Rather than lying about it, you can simply cover it up. And the person that's best known for that is a fellow by the name of Charles Walcott. 1909, he was the director of the Smithsonian. He was an evolutionist on a fossil dig. Um, he was digging in a series of rock called Cambrian rock. It's supposedly 550 million years old or so. He was surprised to find complex fossils in this rock. Basically, he found representatives from every major animal phylum in this ancient rock that's supposedly 550 million years old. Phyla is a uh, uh, um, division that we use to classify organisms. And basically, what's, what we're saying here is basically every major animal classification division, big classification division, was found in this Cambrian rock. This is a real problem, though. It's a problem for two reasons. First of all, this is the uh, way people have been taught fossils for years and years and years. The argument is, if you look at sedimentary rock, which forms, which is the kind of rock you find fossils in, it generally forms layers. And the argument is, these layers form slowly over millions of years. The bottom layer is going to form first, the next, second layer is going to form next, all the way up the chart. So the idea is, if I start digging in sedimentary rock, and I start at the top, I dig down, what I'm doing is I'm digging back in Earth's past. And in fact, they even have dates associated with these layers. If you happen to be in Cretaceous rock, that's supposed to be rock that's around 165 to 140 million years old. You get all the way down to Cambrian rock, where Charles Walcott was digging, and it's supposed to be somewhere between 500 and 570, let's say 550 million years old. The problem is, he found animals in this rock that weren't supposed to be found until this rock, that weren't supposed to be found until this rock, and in fact, they weren't supposed to be found until the lower levels of this rock. But he found them all right here. That's a problem, because they shouldn't have evolved yet. These creatures were 130 million years too early. 
in the fossil record. It was supposed to take 140 million years for all those uh, creatures to form. Unfortunately, they were all found in Cambrian rock. Okay, so what's an evolutionist to do? Oh, well, first we got the geological column. It was considered gospel truth. These fossils showed that at least the bottom was wrong because the geological column says, some of these complex creatures didn't occur till here, yet I find them all here. So that shows that the geological column is wrong. Um, there was simply no way that the simple life forms could evolve into the more complex life forms in only a few tens of millions of years. So what Walcott had discovered was revolutionary. This was data that contradicted a paradigm. As a scientist, what do you do with that? When you find data that contradicts a paradigm, what do you do? You publish. Because this is what makes your name. Uh, not all that long ago, you know, people uh, um, uh, published the fact that the neutrino seems to have mass. This was revolutionary. It wasn't supposed to happen. So in the end, you know, these revolutionary things uh, get published because they contradict paradigms. So you make a name for yourself by publishing things that are revolutionary. What did he do? He hid the fossils. He didn't want anybody to know about them. He hid them in his lab and, for, and it, they, they stayed hidden for almost 80 years until they were rediscovered by a graduate student. And the graduate student was like, wait, these fossils are miscategorized. They can, shouldn't be in Cambrian rock. But they went back to the original day, uh, uh, dig site and found a lot more of those fossils. These fossils, 60,000 in all now, demonstrate what the evolutionists now call the Cambrian explosion. It's still a mystery in evolution because the idea is life suddenly exploded. Evolution suddenly exploded. We have these simple, very simple life forms in pre-Cambrian rock and suddenly evolutionary just exploded to form all of these creatures very, very quickly. Dr. Gerald Schroeder is a professor at MIT. He says authors of high school textbooks and even introductory courses in biology still ignore these data. In the college classes I teach, I regularly encounter students who are being taught the tale of invertebrates gradually evolving into vertebrates. At $15,000 per year tuition, that's an expensive error. The point is, Walcott's discovery and the subsequent discoveries show that at least these four layers of the geological column are not being properly discussed in science textbooks. Because in science textbooks today, you still sit here. These simple creatures and vertebrates evolved into more complex verte invertebrates, which eventually evolved into vertebrates, and it took this 140 million years to do that. Walcott's data says, no, it all happened in Cambrian rock, and we have no idea how. Now, to me, this is the interesting stuff in science, the stuff you can't explain. That's what's interesting, but unfortunately, it's mostly covered up because it goes against the evolutionary paradigm. You can also cover up data that you don't completely understand because you're afraid it might affect your uh, hypothesis. For example, the Mount St. Helens uh, eruption took place nearly 20 years ago, but no textbook, okay, except for mine, uh, <laughs> seems to talk about it in any depth. Um, here's a great picture. Uh, if you ever become a, you know, you go to college, get your college degree, then you go on to grad school. Your first job, if you go into geology, as, uh, in, into a, in geology in a PhD field, your first job as a geology grad student is to get into the photo to provide scale. That's always your first job. So this is a, obviously a first year grad student. Her job is to get in the photo to uh, provide scale. So you can see this wall of rock. You have some idea how big it is because you have some idea how big she is, okay? This is a wall of rock that formed in a total of five hours. Now this is not volcanic rock. Even though it's the result of the Mount St. Helens volcano, volcanic eruption, this is not lava rock. This is volcanic rock. This is sedimentary rock. There's fossils in this rock. Okay? Uh, it formed in five hours because the eruption broke a natural dam, which sent a lot of water rushing. That water picked up a lot of sediment. And here's one place that sediment was deposited. And it formed this nice wall of rock in five hours. Now, this kind of goes against what most uh, geologists want to tell you, how rocks form. Here's a close-up of that same rock. What's interesting about this is we have layers in this rock. Layers in this rock that are very similar to the layers we see in rocks today. Now, if you didn't know this came from Mount St. Helens, uh, the mudslide that occurred after Mount St. Helens, the geologists would say, well, it's, obviously, it's obvious what happened here. Uh, for example, there was a body of water, uh, and sediment slowly trickled out of that body of water, and it formed maybe this layer of rock. And then that layer of rock solidified, and another uh, 